to welcome everyone to the session entitled Elderberry, a rapidly growing specialty crop industry in the U.S. Midwest. And we're actually going to have uh, several speakers, about five today, and they will go ahead and give their talks in six sessions. So if you could hold your questions to the very end. This is a videotaped session, so we need everyone to speak into the microphone. If you have questions at the end, come on up to that one there and go ahead and ask. Um, and Michael Gold will be our first speaker. And I will go ahead and turn it over to him. There are handouts coming out too as well. Oh, my name is Catherine Bonnert, by the way. I'm the moderator. And I work for Lincoln University under the 2501 program. So welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Thank you to uh, North Central Region SARE for supporting our project. Um, we're real excited about Elderberry, and, and uh, as Catherine mentioned, this is a this is going to be a team effort because working with Elderberry is, in fact, a team effort. So we're going to have little vignettes from from different experts. Uh, Terry Durham, are you in here? See that hand raised up? The man standing up in the back there. He he's a uh, uh, one of the primary elderberry groves here in, in uh, the USA. And so the expertise in this room, if, if we don't know the answer to the question, then the answer isn't known at this point in time. I would think it's safe to say. So this, this is, uh, we're just trying to give you a, a real flash sense of uh, what's going on in the state of elderberry uh, here in this part of the country. So I'm Michael Gold. We're also going to have Pat Byers, who works for Extension at the University of Missouri, Andy Thomas, who works at the Southwest Center as an assistant professor in horticulture at the University of Missouri, uh, Ina Chernushko, who's a marketing specialist for the Center for Agroforestry, where I also work, and Larry Godsey, who's an economist in the Center for Agroforestry, where I also work. So others listed on that list, again, are Terry Durham, who's a grower, Francisco Aguilar, who's uh, an economist in the uh, Forestry Department at the University of Missouri, John Brewer, who's an elderberry winemaker in Wichita, Kansas, and Park Bay, who's an agricultural lender. So why, why elderberry? Why the interest in elderberry? Uh, there's a lot of different potential applications for elderberry as an ornamental for wildlife habitat, as a food source. You can plant it in low-lying wet areas riparian, as a riparian buffer. Uh, it's a nice perennial crop. Uh, it enhances ecosystem sustainability, and very importantly, we all believe it's a family farm income opportunity, and that's one of the things we're very excited about. It's a versatile food source for juices, jams, jellies, wines, beverages, fudge, and all kinds of other kinds of products. And uh, there's also research going on in terms of its medicinal properties, boosting the Im immune system. It's high in anthocyanins. It's high in antioxidants. It's high in flavonoids and in a whole bunch of different vitamins, A, B6, C, and iron, and especially in comparison to other similar colored berries. So what I want to do is just quickly give you an overview of this SARE project, and then we'll roll into the different uh, experts to talk about different facets of, of the elderberry. One of the things that we know that got us excited about this is that the demand for the fruit and the flowers of elderberry is increasing from a whole bunch of different sources, from winemakers, from jelly processors, from juice processors, as well as from the nutraceutical companies. The demand in the United States at present is being met by imports from Europe, and we feel that we have a real good opportunity with domestic production to substitute for that import, and I think that's very important. And uh, also important is that global prices are pretty high and demand continues to increase for elderberry products. So just a quick flash background, and some of my colleagues are going to pick up on this. But uh, elderberry research began about 15 years ago in southwest Missouri and also at Missouri State University. And uh, two of the key individuals are in this panel today, Andy Thomas and Pat Byers. And some of the things that have occurred leading up to our current SARE funding they had multi-location, multi-year evaluation of native local elderberry germplasm, and they compared that to some of the varieties developed up in the northeastern United States and Canada, such as Adams, York, and Netzer from the 60s and the 50s and earlier years. And they've been looking at a whole variety of different elderberry traits to assess the different 
uh, native germplasm, including uh, phenology, when does it flower and fruit, and you know, what's its annual behavior, what's the growth like, when is it harvested, what's the yield, looking at different aspects of the flower and the fruit, the quality of the fruit, as well as looking at resistances or susceptibility to disease in insects. There are two new varieties that uh, Andy and Pat have developed that are known as Wildwood and Bob Gordon. And there are also important cultural studies, so ways that we can uh, commercially raise elderberry where it's much more efficient than doing it sort of like grapevines where you just pick off the old wood every year. There are more efficient ways to do this. Two key individuals, again, I already mentioned uh, Terry Durham that began to work with uh, Pat Byers and Andy Thomas. One was Dr. John Brewer, who is uh, uh, the largest elderberry winemaker in the country located in Wichita. And also uh, Terry Durham, who's located here in Boone County. And I believe Terry has the largest elderberry acreage in the country already uh, near Hartsburg, Missouri. So these are the folks that really have, have led the charge and one of the reasons why we've really got a very active and dynamic group of elderberry uh, activities and growers here in central Missouri. So John Brewer has Wildwood Cellars based out of Mulvane, Kansas. And last Friday, one of our SARE activities was to have an elderberry winemaking workshop. Uh, John Brewer makes all kinds of wines from very dry to very sweet. And we had a chance to taste just a few of those last Friday. There's John uh, giving his presentation here in town. And this is one of the wines that, that he sells. This is a whole bunch of images of Terry Durham at his Eridu Farms here in Boone County, Missouri. And you can see uh, raising the, the elderberry plants in the greenhouse, how the plants look like on his farm, and some of the processing. And Terry's in the middle there with some of his value-added product. Uh, as I said, Terry has been very key in hosting elderberry field days, working with growers, stimulating interest in acreage planted amongst growers and producing and marketing value-added products. And I want to put a plug in for tomorrow because Terry's offering an elderberry short course here at the Small Farm Trade Show. So if you want to go more in depth on elderberry tomorrow, you'll have an opportunity to do that. A little bit more background about our project. Uh, in contrast to Europe, where elderberry is relatively well known, uh, it's not really well known here in the United States. And so this is one of our tasks, is to increase the familiarity with elderberry. Catherine, just do jumping jacks when I have, do I have three minutes right now? Oh, okay, that's, that's fun, because I got a lot of slides. All right. Uh, we know that there's a lot of information that's lacking, and that's one of the things that we're doing across both the biology and the economics of elderberry. Again, there's active research at the University of Missouri by Andy Thomas and Pat Byers. They've got the new cultivars developed, and we also have a lot of active market and economics research. Some of the outcomes of our project that we expect. One is to support the establishment of existing growers and new elderberry growers or clusters of growers. We also need to provide decision-making information to help landowners make that no or no-go decision on elderberry production so they can reduce their risk in getting involved in this. We also want to expand elderberry value-added production and support the growth of regional agritourism. These are a couple of things that uh, we have produced in the Center for Agroforestry, growing and marketing elderberries in Missouri, and we'll hand out a copy of this guide, and it's also, also available on our center website, as well as more in-depth elderberry market research, which you can find on our center website. Some other outcomes. We're going to increase knowledge about the elderberry market and future trends, increase knowledge about consumer preferences for elderberry. Uh, Larry Godsey is going to talk about an elderberry financial decision support tool, which is really something that you can take to, to the lenders to try to get a loan and to really plug in your own individual information to decide what elderberry costs and benefits will be for you. We hope to, hope to increase coordination among players in the industry and ultimately increase consumption of elderberry with resultant positive human health in benefits. And I wanted to mention that there is a National Institute of Health funded uh, study that includes elderberry ongoing at the University of Missouri. And finally, the bonus coming in 2013, we're hosting the first international symposium on elderberry, both for researchers as well as landowners here in Columbia, Missouri at the... Stony Creek Inn. All right, so that's the quick overview, and I want to now slide on to some more in-depth discussion with uh, Pat Byers. 
Thank you, Mike. Well, as a horticulturist, um, I recognize, and those of you who are growing out there also recognize, that one of the most important aspects for success on a farm is to select those cultivars that are adapted to your particular environment. And early on, as, as uh, Andy and I worked with elderberry, one of the things we realized is that there was a huge, huge pool of elderberry germplasm that had not been explored. Basically, we're talking about the elderberries that are native here to the Midwest. Up until the, the work that we began, most of the cultivars that were available were developed in the, uh, in the Maritimes of Canada or in New York. And the climate there, the growing conditions there are, are very different than what they are here in the Midwest. And the other thing that, that, um, that we recognize too is the, the importance of testing. And, and as we went through these projects, as we, we worked towards developing cultivars suited for the Midwest, we tested these elderberries widely. And, and we learned from this research that elderberry is somewhat site specific, that what does well on my farm in, in Greene County may not do well in your farm in northern Missouri or, or your farm in Illinois or your farm in, on the west coast. So there is a need for wide testing of elderberry cultivars, and that was part of our project. But basically what I'd like to do is walk you quickly through the elderberry cultivar picture as it is today, talk about our work with developing elderberry cultivars, and then finish up with some thoughts on where we may be going in the future. So again, the perfect elderberry cultivar. We'd love to have an elderberry cultivar that is widely adaptable. We'd love to have an elderberry cultivar that is self-fruitful. We're interested in productivity. We're also interested in the plant itself and how it grows. We need uh, cultivars that will fruit on new shoots because as you'll hear, one of the uh, projects we're investigating is efficient harvest of elderberries. And then we'd love to have elderberries that have genetic resistance to insect and disease problems. Well, the reality is we don't have any perfect elderberry cultivars. We think that we're making progress, but there's still huge room for development as far as, as cultivar development goes. We're also, of course, interested not just in the plant, but in the, uh, the flower and fruit, because those are the marketable parts of the plant. And so we're interested in all these things that you see here, characteristics related to the flowers, but also characteristics related to the, the individual fruits and the fruit clusters. Now, the uh, oldest cultivars that are currently available are Adams 1 and Adams 2, and they're still probably among the most widely planted elderberry cultivars. Both were selected from wild elderberry plants in New York back in the 1920s. And uh, over the years, there has been a blending of those two cultivars, and there are some experts who don't consider them distinct anymore, but at least originally, they were distinct, and you still see both of them offered in, in the nursery trade. A cultivar called Easy Off was developed, um, again, from unknown parentage, likely selected from the wild, also in New York, but to our knowledge, that cultivar has been lost. Now, you still see it mentioned in the, in the literature, and it's also mentioned as a parent for some of the cultivars to come, but We've not been able to track that particular one down. York, this is a cultivar also developed in New York. It was the result of an organized breeding program, the idea being to develop an improved cultivar through hybridization. And it was a cross of Adams II and the one I mentioned earlier, which is Easy Off. Has uh, large clusters, the berries are large. Um, it's a little bit later than Adams I and Adams II, and there's some obvious advantages to being able to spread out the harvest season on elderberry which too is one of the goals in our particular development program. And it has large, uh, the plant itself is large and productive. So you know, we're getting a little bit closer to what we might consider an ideal elderberry. And we feel that York has performed reasonably well here in Missouri, but again, there's still room for improvement. Then there was a whole series of cultivars developed in the Maritimes, uh, specifically in Nova Scotia. And the uh, first one that came out was John's. This was an old, old cultivar that had been growing as a, as a backyard plant for many, many years and eventually was named and released by the Kentville Station. And then a group of cultivars were developed at Kentville. Um, these included Kent, Nova Scotia, and Victoria. And you can see their characteristics up here. And they do, they do quite well in the northeastern U.S. and in the Maritimes, but have not performed as well under our Midwestern environmental conditions as, as we would like. So again, the concerns that, that Andy and I had as we began to develop the elderberry development program in the, uh, the late 90s was for this industry, or for, for an industry to develop and for it to progress and, and for us to see improvement, we needed to have cultivars that were adapted to growing here in the Midwest. Those cultivars that were currently available come from a narrow genetic base. They're not all that well suited for growing here, and we knew this because we had trialed these cultivars for, for a number of years at, at a number of locations. Um, we had some questions about the actual identity of some of these. You know, these cultivars have been available for many years, and anyone who's grown elderberries know that they sucker profusely, and plants that are close together in time will lose identity as the, the plants grow together. So we were concerned about that. There seems to be a widespread issue with virus infection in many of these older cultivars. 
And as I said before, they just didn't do all that well in, here in Missouri. So our solution was to, to begin a program, one of the process, uh, projects in our program, to develop uh, better cultivars for the Midwest. And as uh, Mike mentioned, two of those have been named and released, and those are Wildwood and Bob Gordon. And I'd like to briefly describe those for you. Uh, Wildwood was re uh, released in 2010. This was a plant originally found in um, uh, Oklahoma. It was found near Eufaula, and it was found by Jack Milliken, who was married to John Brewer's mother. So there's a connection there between Wildwood Cellars and Wildwood Elderberries, I'm sure you figured out. Uh, we uh, began testing it in 1998 and uh, tested it under several test names. Uh, here's a picture of John and, and, and Marge Milliken. And again, I have to really give them a... a, a, a an appreciation, a debt of gratitude to these, these two folks because they've been huge supporters of our program. Wildwood is a large plant. It's a tall shrub. Um, it uh, breaks bud fairly early in the spring, about the same time as Adams too. blooms in June. One thing, the, uh, when we're thinking about these particular plants, we're obviously interested in the fruit, but we're also interested in the flowers because that's another potential market for elderberry. And in the case of wildwood, the florets are easily removed and they can be dried as a, as a product. Uh, we don't know specifically if it's self-fertile, if it needs to be cross-pollinated, but uh, in our trials, it has been a prolific producer of fruit, and it does set fruit quite well. There's an example of, of a, a flower cluster on a first-year shoot on Wildwood. Again, well, that's a huge cluster. That's my hand there holding it. Harvest season is a little bit later than Adams too, generally by about uh, two to uh, three weeks, and also later than Bob Gordon, the second one that we've developed. So again, our goal is to lengthen the season, and we feel that we have with, with Wildwood. Uh, again, late July here in Missouri. Um, it's interesting because it does ripen shoots over a period of time, although if it's managed, and, and I'm sure we'll hear about this, as a plant that's annually renewed, the harvest season is condensed down to about three weeks. Um, if you don't prune them, you've got a longer harvest season. The uh, cymes present in an upright fashion, and this is a bit of a disadvantage because upright uh, cymes tend to be more heavily bird predated, but we haven't seen any major problems from that, but just again, something to be aware of. The uh, clusters are loose, fairly large clusters, especially on unpruned plants, you know, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, on pruned plants, an 83 gram cluster is a big cluster of berries. And it does sometimes produce secondary clusters, so you get a second harvest or a later harvest off of these plants. And just a shot to show you what wildwood looks like in, in our uh, evaluation trials. And there's an example of a cluster on a plant that had been pruned back. The berries are dark purple. They ripen uniformly, and they're resistant to shattering, again, which are things that we were interested in. The individual berries are quite large. Um, we did notice some yield variability. Again, the effect that, that uh, elderberries seem to be site-dependent, and this was certainly the case with, with our trials in Mountain Grove and Mount Vernon with this particular cultivar. And as far as juice characteristics, uh, it was quite well suited for winemaking and also for use as a, a, a jelly or something along those lines. Rate, rate, rated as slightly to moderately susceptible to leaf spots. Uh, we did notice areified mite injury, which we'll hear more about too, but it didn't seem to be significantly worse than Adams too. The second one is Bob Gordon, and Bob Gordon was released in 2011, and it was originally found near Osceola, Missouri, on the, uh, the farm of, of uh, Bob Gordon. And here's Bob and, and his wife Kay. Uh, it's not as large a shrub as wildwood. It's uh, smaller in stature, a uh, little bit later bud break, same bloom time. Again, the florets are easy to remove and make a very nice dried product. And again, as is the case with wildwood, we have some questions about pollination. Uh, similar harvest season to Adams too, so it's definitely earlier than wildwood, mid-July mid in, in Missouri. Uh, same harvest uh, pr uh, procedure as far as when the, the clusters ripen, and again, about a four-week period of ripening if you don't prune them back. One thing that's unique about Bob Gordon is that the, uh, flower, the uh, cymes are held in a decumbent position and they're less attractive to birds, at least in our experience. So this, this might be an advantage from the standpoint of bird predation. The cymes are, are, are large compared to Adams too, and again, a 126 gram cyme is, is a pretty good sized cyme, and about 2.3 kilograms per bush in, in our trials. And here's a picture of Bob Gordon in the field. Again, notice how those cymes are kind of hanging down that's a characteristic that makes them less attractive to birds. And there's a, a close-up of a, of a sign of Bob Gordon. Again, the berry quality is very nice, dark in color, uh, ripen uniformly, and they're resistant to shattering. A little bit uh, smaller berry than, than uh, some of the others we've tested. And again, yield variability noted between our test sites. There's what Bob Gordon looks like harvested in a, in a, in a lug. 
And again, good quality as far as the juice, uh, char uh, juice characteristics that would make it quite suitable for wine making or for processing into jelly. Again, it was rated as slightly susceptible to uh, both mites and to leaf spot diseases, and it seemed to be more resistant to these problems than Adams II in one study, and then very similar to Adams II in, in a second study. As far as the future, this work is ongoing. We've just completed our most recent trial looking at uh, elderberry selections, and we feel we have some that, that may be suitable for, for release as improved cultivars. But keep in mind, it's a, it's a long-term process to develop cultivars. We want to be sure that they're adequately tested to make sure that they are indeed suited to our environment here. So again, stay tuned. There will be more coming from that particular project. Here's our contact information. If you'd like more information on the development of cultivars, please contact us. We'd be happy to speak with you. Okay. Thank you. I'm Andy Thomas with the University of Missouri based in Mount Vernon uh, in southwest Missouri. And Dr. Gold and Pat have kind of covered a lot of this, so I, I'm going to just give a background and update on some of the research that's kind of been accomplished and underway. So a little background, uh, I've always had kind of a personal interest in native, undeveloped fruit and nut crops. So this is just, I, I started my job in 1996, and Patrick and I uh, went to a meeting in 1997 in Wichita uh, where we met uh, John Brewer. It was, it was a small fruit meeting, and they served uh, John's wine uh, at the meeting, and we tasted this wine, and it was really good. This was elderberry wine. And we asked John, where are you getting your elderberries for this wine? And he said, oh, we just walk along the railroad track, and we, we pick fruit. And Pat and I looked at, you, at each other and thought, we can grow this. This is a really you know, maybe a great opportunity. So that's kind of where our thinking began. Uh, about that time, the Center for Agroforestry began kind of, they were very supportive of, of developing elderberry <clears throat> as a crop. Patrick and I began uh, uh, presenting uh, some of this uh, interest at conferences kind of like this, asking folks like you, do you have any elderberries that your grandmother has grown that we might, you know, collect and begin looking at? And several of, of people did. Uh, and I'll mention a little bit later, we did, uh, we have a collection of about 60 varieties. So we began getting a few grants, which we'll talk a little bit about. And then Terry Durham has already been mentioned several times uh, as this thing developed. Terry uh, was, uh, showed a lot of interest early on in our program. And of course, several years later, uh, it's, it's really blossomed. So th the initial research uh, was mostly at Mount Vernon and Mountain Grove, Missouri. I don't know if you all are from Missouri, but... Mount Vernon is in southwest Missouri. Mountain Grove is in kind of south central Missouri. Um, our first significant plantings were about 1999. And I mentioned these, these uh, selections that we, we collected. We ended up with about 60 of these, including the varieties that Patrick mentioned from Canada and New York. We began evaluating these. And in about 2000, we planted our very significant pruning study. And again, I have the Agroforestry Center uh, supported this financially. It was just tremendous. We didn't have much funding yet for this, so very, very grateful to that. Uh, a couple years later, 2003, uh, our first cultivar trial was planted. So the pruning study was a six or seven year study, uh, and it's since been published, and it was kind of a groundbreaking study that showed that elderberry can be harvested by cutting it to the ground every year, uh, making it very simple to prune and harvesting very large clusters. Uh, I think it kind of turned the tide on, on like for the way Terry grows elderberries. So I'm not going to go into detail on these grants, but we then, starting about 2004, started getting some grants. So the, as the interest grew in elderberry, it was, it was tremendous uh, getting some grants, small grants to start with. And as you can kind of see, they got a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. This... This is the SARE grant that this conference, I don't, that, that is kind of supporting this conference here today. Uh, and then uh, in 2010, I, I worked closely with a group of biochemists uh, at the University of Missouri and uh, botanists at Missouri Botanical Garden. As a team, uh, we uh, obtained a tremendous grant from National Institutes of Health, which I'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. And I still want to, down here, University of Missouri Agroforestry Center has continued to support us during all this. So until the, the big NIH grant, we haven't had a lot of money, but we've had enough money to kind of float this program. And then uh, last year, uh, we got some more grants for the, for the symposium that Dr. Gold mentioned. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So again, their interest is out there. These are not 
huge grants, but $60,000 is a lot of money that we can use to put on this symposium. So I won't go into great detail here at all, but a lot of studies have been completed. Some of these have been published. Uh, we, we published a paper on uh, antioxidants and medicinal compounds in the non-fruit tissues, that's the flowers, the leaves, and the stems. And I'm working very hard on a paper right now on the antioxidants in the fruit. Hopefully this will be published next year. I know there's a lot of interest in that. Um, we had, we've completed two cultivar trials and the, the varieties that uh, Patrick mentioned, the Wildwood and Bob Gordon, were published out of uh, the results from those studies. Uh, the pruning study I mentioned, uh, we've done a fair bit of juice analysis and some kind of preliminary DNA analysis just to kind of understand the genetic diversity in elderberry. A lot more work to do in those uh, fields. Uh, and I put this slide in because meanwhile we're, we're growing, we're doing these projects. We've never actually done a real research study on propagation, but guess what? We've learned how to propagate and grow these things. We've learned a lot about pests and diseases. We've gained a lot of experience. And then meanwhile, a lot of growers have started growing these things. So the body of knowledge is really increasing. It's all, you know, coming together and really benefiting this. And the guide sheet, did you all get this? This handout, this, this looks maybe simple, but this, in my opinion, was a monumental work to put this thing together. And it's a very comprehensive, it's about, a, what, 12 pages? A 12-page guide on growing and marketing elderberries in Missouri, and everyone here helped. So this is really, I really am proud of this. So uh, everyone should get one of those. It's on the website. That I messed my slide up. Mm -hmm. So that's the guide sheet I'm mentioning. So, and then other ongoing studies, more uh, studies on antioxidants and the nutrition of elderberry. What's happening is is the wine and the jelly industry has kind of started this, uh, but what is happening now is the dietary supplement and nutrace nutraceutical interest is really overtaking that. Uh, for example, uh, the leaf elemental profile, we need, as horticulturists, we need to be able to sample a leaf in July and determine, does this thing, is it, is it lacking in phosphorus or potassium or nitrogen? This is a very understudied crop, underdeveloped, so there's a lot of real basic things to learn, such as the basic soil fertility. Um, we, we have started now a very simple nitrogen fertility study. It can't get any simpler than that, but it's so important for farmers. You're, if you're not putting enough nitrogen on, you're not getting your maximum yield. If you're putting too much on, you're wasting money and harming the environment. So we really need to, to know these very basic things. Uh, Patrick mentioned the cultivar screening. Uh, also, I'm, the winemaking I'm, I'm mentioning here, uh, the University of Missouri uh, has uh, what's now called the Grape and Wine Institute. And they're, they're not real hot on elderberries. They're, they're very much a grape wine group, but guess what? They're making elderberry wine now. They went to the workshop that Dr. Gold mentioned, and I'm bringing them 80 kilograms of fruit in two weeks to make elderberry wine. So it's, 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 it's happening. Okay, briefly, I'm about done. The National Institutes of Health funded this center it's called the it's University of Missouri Center for Botanical Interaction Studies. I mentioned it also includes Missouri Botanical Garden. Uh, and it's a five-year grant, $7.7 .7 million. Elderberry is one of five species. So there's medicinal species that are being studied. And most of the experiments involve mice. And it's a it's a attempt to really get to the bottom looking at cancer stroke and infectious diseases using these mice, what is elderberry capable of doing? Uh, and it, it's still, we're really in the heart of this grant. There, uh, there's not a lot of uh, results yet. Probably the most interesting result so far is on stroke. And I don't understand uh, what all they're doing, but there's very positive results from mice that have been either treated with elderberry before a stroke or after a stroke. So I don't, I'm not a biochemist, I can't understand that, but it's very positive results. So uh, stay tuned on the rest of these. Hopefully in the next year or two, there'll be a lot more of this results coming out. Dr. Gold mentioned the International Elderberry Symposium, which again, it's next summer. 
here in Colombia. It's being organized under the auspices of this International Society for Horticultural Science. And I, uh, there will be, it's kind of a two-part symposium. The first three days, and it's June 9th to 14th, the first three days are a scientific symposium. We have researchers from Denmark, Germany, Israel, Portugal, United Kingdom, Egypt, Canada, I'm forgetting some, of course, United States coming. So we're really trying to bring these people together all, from all over the world who are studying elderberry. Farmers are invited to this, but then also there will be a, a kind of uh, overlapping and then after it, two days of, of a farmer's forum. So there will be a lot more information about all that. And there's a web, Mike showed the website. So I'm done. I just wanted to show these partners. I'm not going to go, go through them. Uh, lots of people involved in the development of elderberry here in Missouri. And I have a pretty picture to finish. So <clears throat> thank you. Picking wild elderberries for about 10 years, and one of the challenges is just the huge variability in them. Um, you know, I'll go to a bush and it'll have elder blow and ripe berries on the same bush at the same time. And the, the weather seems to, this year there was almost nothing as far as a wild elderberry crop. Uh, are you breeding for more stability in the harvest? And uh, Well, did you hear the question? I mean, Patrick may have addressed this, but unevening ripening in the cluster is a very deleterious characteristic. We don't want that. We want all of the berries to ripen in the cluster at the same time so you can just pick them all at once. So the answer is yes. I mean, that's a very, very important characteristic of, of selecting varieties. And this, the drought this year was just horrific. Um, and elderberries love water. So this was a really difficult year for, for even irrigated crops. So... Okay, I'm Ina Czernuszka. I work with the Center for Agroforestry. I apologize for my accent. I hope you can understand me. Uh, so we are shifting now to the market studies. Uh, when we started to work on elderberry at the Center for Agroforestry, product cultivar and production research was underway. You just heard about that from Pat and Andy. They were working on elderberry but there was not much information out there about the market and the market potential and what consumers want to, to see in elderberry products, what, what do they prefer. So we applied to this SARE grant and through this SARE grant we got funding to conduct uh, uh, research on the market and it's the first one uh, in the US for sure. Um, So we uh, designed a study uh, to, that was like a two-step study. We uh, sent a nationwide survey to 159 uh, people that we identified through internet search because it was no information who is growing, what is growing. So through internet search, we put together a database of people that were involved in anything elderberry and um, we received 74 responses, and we followed up with in-depth interviews to get more detailed information about the market, about these people, what they grow, and uh, how. Uh, how are they involved in the, in the elderberry industry? So when we designed this study, we tried to find out who is out there, what are they doing related to elderberry, what are they buying, what are they selling, uh, how do they get along, along, along to each other if they compete, if they co cooperate? And um, uh, how difficult it was for them to establish an elderberry business and uh, what were the opportunities or challenges? So, oh, yes. So what we found out from the survey, from the survey that we distributed nationwide, was that elderberry is a new industry, is very new, small, we kind of knew about that because uh, we didn't know of too many people that were involved in the elderberry industry. 
and most of the respondents were part-timers or hobbyists. So they only added a part something elderberry to their business, like a winery that was uh, doing uh, grape wine, but also fruit wine and maybe elderberry wine, or nurseries that were growing many plants, but elderberry one of them. Um, some elderberry growers and uh, like that. But besides that, there, were, there are some entrepreneurs, some uh, big, um, some people that actually invested in the elderberry business and they were 100% elderberry and uh, they have a very hard job is uh, to, to grow the, the industry and to educate the consumer and to focus not only on their slice on their business but to focus on the whole industry and help it grow. Some of the results, because I don't have too much time, I will just go very quickly through some of the results that especially um, the interview helped us better understand uh, what motivated people to, to start an elderberry business. And um, some mentioned that uh, the increased, increased interest in the new locally produced foods was one of the drivers that made them start elderberry and that elderberry is a native plant that can be grown sustainable and uh, in um, sustainable agriculture, uh, agricultural systems. Uh, the ones that were more involved in the business, they really want to grow the business, to develop, develop new elderberry products, and to grow the industry. The hobbyists were more like, oh, I try to experiment and see how it's going. But uh, those that are really involved really want to, to do something. Um, we try to identify some challenges. Um, finances is one of them. You need some uh, capital to start uh, an elderberry business. Uh, not, yes, not a lot, but you need, uh, you need some. And uh, one of the challenges was how to obtain credit, because elderberry is not so known and banks don't know about uh, elderberry and they don't uh, are reluctant to provide funds supply is not enough supply if you want to plant now uh, acres of elderberry you cannot buy those plants and especially the cultivars that uh, pat mentioned um, if you want to to pick from the wild uh, they are inexperienced pickers some of them and uh, it's not enough anyway Lack of information on production, but we are working on that. We now have the guide which uh, uh, provides information on that side. Uh, very labor intensive. If you want to, to do value added, add it. Uh, there is no processing plant. Um, challenges regarding uh, sales and marketing and being so small, it, uh, it's hard to get into the distribu distribution system. Some distributors require a uh, uh, larger volume. And especially in the wine industry, people mentioned uh, all kinds of regulations that uh, make it difficult for them. So we mentioned some, um, some of the problems with, on the supply side. Uh, you can do some product. You can make some products out of concentrate, but concentrate you need to import from Europe, and it's harder to harder and harder to obtain, and it becomes more expensive. There are all kinds of products that are being sold, uh, from plants to wine to syrup, many many uh, that came up in our surveys that our respondents produce, and the goods sign is that everybody said that demand is increasing for elderberry products. I, I put here some quotes. Uh, demand more than I can supply, that's a good problem to have. And uh, demand is increasing and chefs are interested in, uh, in this area. Uh, we also wanted to see if okay, I want to buy elderberry, but can I buy something else? Is, uh, if I want to promote elderberry, everybody's going to, to go to, to buy elderberry, or there are other products that can be uh, substituted for elderberry. And of course they are. But however, elderberry has very unique properties, the health benefits, 
the flavor, taste, history, tradition. Everybody remembers uh, uh, grandma's elderberry jelly or elderberry pie and uh, uh, grandpa's elderberry wine. And we also wanted to see if, there is, if they feel that there is competition, and most of them said no. Uh, demand is high, so we, we have enough. Uh, it's not not problem for, for growers, for winemakers. They co cooperate, they create uh, festivals together. Uh, Value-added producers create their own niche markets and differen differentiate their product from, uh, from, another, from the other ones. There is some competition for uh, dietary supplements um, producers because of Europe uh, and uh, products from Europe and uh, some leading brands that got some recognition, but they still they don't, see it, is, don't see it as a threat. So this is what I had. We have the whole report uh, on the website. It looks like that. Well, I'm, uh, I'm the cleanup batter for this group. I hope you've enjoyed the presentations about elderberry. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about economics. Um, there's been a lot of talk about cultivars and markets and things like that, but I'm the guy that they usually come up and go, well, can I make any money doing this? And um, I'm going to tell you the, the standard economics answer is it depends. It really depends. A lot of people come up and say, how much money can you make growing elderberry? Well, it really depends on a lot of things. And, and because it depends on so many things, I've made a career out of uh, developing models that add all the different... Uh, scenarios into it. And what I'm showing you here is a, an Excel spreadsheet based decision support model, financial model for elderberry that's based on, uh, based very heavily on Terry Durham's uh, elderberry plantation or his operation and how he would recommend that we do this. It has costs and everything in it. I usually design these things um, so that a landowner really doesn't have to know much about how to do it. Uh, we give them, we give them the, Excel, or the uh, guide sheet and this model is based a lot on the guide sheet. So uh, this model is available free to anybody that wants it. It's at our website, centerforagroforestry.org. It's like I said, it's an Excel based, so you can download it onto your computer, uh, open it up, run your numbers. Um, but I'm just going to quickly go over this so you can see what basic assumptions are in this model. Uh, I, de I developed the model into uh, three main parts, uh, establishment costs, management costs, harvesting and marketing costs, and then down here in the, the little green box at the bottom, this is where all the good numbers come back, you know, the positive returns and all that kind of stuff. I also understand that some people don't understand finance, but they do know that if I invest a dollar today, how long will it take me to get that dollar back? That's really what they want to know. Uh, so I might be talking net present value, and I might be talking internal rate of return. I might talk modified internal rate of return. And some of you may know what I'm talking about. But real, what really makes sense to the landowner is if I put a dollar in today, how long will I get that before I get that dollar back? And on top of that, how many dollars will I make on this? That's really what they're interested in. So that's what this model presents. And um, basically, the, the, the design of this model is it's all based on drop downs and defaults. If you don't know what I mean by that, I'll just show you. Every one of these white blanks up here in this model, in the yellow area of this model, already has defaults in there. So you don't have to know how to do site prep. We give you four options for site prep that are the common options, like disking up a field or disking up a field and putting Roundup on it to kill the weeds, you know, getting the site established. Uh, that's all in there. In fact, all you got to do is select the op option that you want, and then the cost will automatically go into the model for that option. You don't have to know what it costs you because I've already put that in there for you. Now this model uh, has all these options for you. W another option that we have is uh, spacing. A lot of people go, what's, a, what's the optimum spacing for elderberry? Well, it depends. It depends on all your other assumptions. But I'll tell you what, in this model, you can plug in a couple of different spacing options and see which one returns the best return that you want. Um, in this case, I've got it, we've got it set up as a four foot by 12 foot spacing, four foot between the plants or tw and 12 foot between the rows or two foot by 12 foot. That's the way we've got it set up. I think Terry recommends a four by 12. Is that right, Terry? For plants, per, for plants. that's what he recommends is a four by 12. Uh, so you can play with this however you want. 
We also have irrigation or not irrigation. We have organic or not organic in terms of how you establish this setup. We even have uh, planting cost. Are you going to plant it by machine? Are you going to do it by hand? All those are in included in the analysis of this model. We even have fertilization, the recommended fertilization rates and the cost of doing that. You don't need to know what it costs to apply the fertilizer. We put it in there for you. So all you have to do is select the management technique that you think you're going to use, and it'll kick out the number in terms of return. For example, right now we have uh, site prep. It's herbicide with disking. Uh, I think we got a 4x12 spacing. Yeah, 4x12 spacing. We're mulching with uh, plastic mulch, and we're putting irrigation uh, tape down with the mulch. And I believe, again, that's, I'll look at Terry Durham. I think those guys will do that or will show you how to do that, the mulch and tape, irrigation tape. And um, they, we also have planting stock is going to be cuttings, and these are selected varieties. Uh, hand planting, uh, fertilization, and permanent grass cover between the rows. That's all set up in your establishment, okay? Um, management options. Uh, most of the time we talk about management options on what are we going to do around the trees. Well, we're going to compost, a pre-made compost. Uh, you can also change that to, uh, I think we've got, Wood chips. Every one of these options has another button down there called user defined. If, you've, if you're doing something that we hadn't thought about, you can modify this model very easily by putting in a cost that you know of and put it into the model, and it'll calculate right into the model just like everything else. Now, these models are unique because they have production, growth and yield included with the finances. And what I do for growth and yield is I estimate what I consider to be a uh, yield for elderberry over time. I kind of draw a timeline out and say, okay, in year two, they're going to produce this much. In year three, this much. And I do that for, I think this model goes out to 25 years. And then what I do is I, I create a, I plot a trend line on that, which gives me an equation. I plug that equation in. But before you think that I'm being very optimistic on these models, I also plant, plug in a random number generator to cover the, the chances that maybe one year you have a bad yield or one year you have drought, and that's all pro programmed into the model, so all the risk is also programmed into the model. Um, but if you look at all these things, it, going up to harvesting and marketing decisions, right now we have it set for hand harvest. All those costs are included. We know how much you can harvest per acre, you know, in an hour. Um, and then we have the an expected rate of return. Right now I've got it set for the basic rate of inflation, 3%. So you're at least earning the rate of inflation on this particular scenario. And then I have an expected price per pound plugged in, and I'm using a dollar per pound, which I, I think is a little bit low on what, what the current market is. But let's, let's just pretend it's a dollar a pound. Um, what it says in this model is that if you put in all these assumptions with this model, your net present value or your return on this, you're going to initially plant 907 elderberry plants on an acre. You're going to... Your revenues, your present value of your revenues is $81,000 per acre. Uh, your present value of your cost is $26,000 per acre. Um, the net present value of this scenario is $54,000 per acre. Your rate of return, or actually your investment return rate, is 18%. Uh, to see if the stock market can beat that. I don't think it can right now. Um, and the internal rate of return... Uh, is pretty high. We're saying 65%, but I, that's pretty high. And then, more importantly, when you invest in this, you'll have your dollars paid off in three years. Your initial investment will be paid off in three years with this particular system. Uh, that's your initial investment to establish this will be paid off in three years, and from then on, it's all profit to you. Uh, does that make sense to you? Okay. And so we also do something... So we can compare this annually with annual row crops. We call it an annual equivalent value. If we were to invest in this and uh, get the same net present value equally over a certain number of years, that annual equivalent value for this was $1,967. We kind of try to compare that to what does an annual acre of, of corn provide to you or what does an acre of soybeans give you annually. And as you can see, that's probably three times what an acre of corn would would pay you. So this model is available online. If you have any questions with this model or if you don't think it fits your scenario, you're welcome to call me. I think my number is on the handout or my, my email is on the handout. You can call me. 
we can modify these very quickly. It's designed to be modified for everybody's scenario very quickly. And we can sit down and go through your actual system and, and see what the uh, what your expectation should be. Now, I want to emphasize this is not a promised dollar amount. I can't, I can't go to the bank and say this is what the, the guy at the small farm trade show told me I was going to make on this. This is an estimate based on a certain number of assumptions, which are all listed right here on this front page. Um, if you have any questions, we can go through it. I, I know what you're talking about. The question is, I have different tabs across the bottom. For most people who just want to get in here and get a quick look, the management input tab is the main, the main interface with this. If, uh, if you want to look at the cost budget, in other words, if you want to go to the bank and to borrow money, the bank was going to require you to do a business plan, and here is your enterprise budget for your business plan. It's all there. You just print it out, take it to the bank. If you want to do, uh, if you want to modify any of the stuff that maybe you, maybe you do site prep different than anything I've considered. You can go in here under user defined put in some other cost in the yellow that's based on your site prep situation and that number will automatically go into the model as your site prep cost. You can do that with any of the costs that I have in there. If something's different than what I have as a default, you can modify it any way you want um, as long as it makes sense. Now, with any kind of model, it's uh, what we call garbage in, garbage out. So if your assumptions are incorrect, the model is going to be incorrect. But these assumptions that are currently in the model are based on the current, most current practice and most current costs and most current production yields. So um, I consider it to be fairly accurate. Be because of the bird issue, has there been any work done with covering the area? I mean, it'd be somewhat contained, but. Yes, the question was, uh, you know, the issues with birds, uh, have you have you done anything with covering? So yes, we have looked at netting uh, plantings and anytime you net a planting, it, it adds a, uh, an extra layer to management. Um, it is an effective way to protect the crop, but you have to weigh the cost of netting and the, the cost of a labor to put it up, take it down, uh, against the, the, uh, the value of using that practice. And at least in research plots, we had to do it because we were interested in collecting meaningful data. In a commercial field, I'm not sure that the numbers are there to make it justifiable. Now, with some crops like blueberries or, or wine grapes, yes, we commonly net those crops. With elderberries, you know, it, it is a practice that's available to protect the crop. Uh, this summer, we, we netted some of our elderberries, and I, I bought bird netting. It was about $300 for 1,000 feet, and that would cover the whole row. And it took us quite a while to figure out how to get it on there. We ended up using Coke bottles to cover steel posts and string and twine, and it was, we got it done. Uh, and it certainly protected, but of course, then when you harvest, you had to get the thing off, and now I've got this giant netting I have to store somewhere. So as Pat said, it has its plus and minuses, but we, we did do it. We'll keep going until you cut us off, by the way. I find this fascinating. How often do you update these uh, cost figures? And are do you, at this website, is there similar models for different crops? I just want to say I just got that this is the last question. So okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, the the question is how often do I update this? Um, this model we just came out with a year or two ago. Uh, it hasn't been updated, but it's the cost haven't changed that much. Uh, I want to point out that this is returns to labor, to, to management and land as well. That's what these returns are. Uh, I do have another model for uh, chestnut, uh, a Chinese chestnut. I have a model for black walnut for nut production. I have a model for pine, for pine straw, loblolly pine. Um, I have one for jatropha if anybody wants to raise jatropha for oil production, but that, that was for Mexico. Um, but these models, most of these models, except for the chestnut model, these are online at our website. You can go to our website and pull these up, and they're free. And if you have a, if you want to play with them, if you find something that you have confusion with, just give me a call about them because they're kind of a hobby for me too. Well, thank you all for for coming. Uh, you should, from the information passed out, have all of our contact information, and we're happy to speak with you down the road. So.
Thank you very much.